Sean, welcome back to the show. Thank you, sir. Good to be back. So uh, we did a previous episode talking about the dangers of AI and how it's going to manipulate the entire population, how to combat it, which was fascinating. We're recording a second episode just a couple hours after that. So anybody who has not seen that, I highly encourage you to go back and watch the previous episode with Sean. It is some of the most intriguing content that we've ever recorded here. And so today, so you're no stranger to the show. So today we're going to get into the Monroe Institute and remote viewing, how you got involved in that. What's the Monroe Institute? Talk about, you know, some of the stuff that <clears throat> CIA and the, Mo and the Monroe Institute have uh, collaborated on and uh, when it comes to remote viewing and, and, um, and we'll get into it. Nice. But uh, yeah, really, I am super pumped about this episode as well. The last, we took a long lunch to uh, reset our brains from, <laughs> from, from the previous one. We're recording two in one day. But because it's a separate episode, everybody always gets a gift. No matter how many times you come on the show, you got any ideas? I don't know. Let me guess. Come on. <laughs> come on. Thank you, sir. Nice. Yeah. Vigilance Elite gummy bears. I feel like I just gave you the exact same bag with the exact same Vigilance Elite gummy bears. Thank you for re-gifting it. About four <laughs> hours ago. <laughs> so. back, back to me. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm going to eat them. I'm going to share them with my son. You should. Yeah. You should. I'll give you some extra ones. Nice. Since we're doing... Uh, Appreciate it. <laughs> two episodes. But anyways, digging into... I've been very interested in the topic of remote viewing and the Monroe Institute. I found out about the Monroe Institute several years ago, uh, just kind of digging around at some stuff in, 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 <clears throat> and in remote viewing seen some things um i won't go into it but uh i've i've seen some things let's just say i've seen some things overseas i've seen some people brought in and um or let me rephrase that i haven't seen these things i know people who i've worked with who have seen these um well they've used remote viewing for yes operations yeah and it's effective it it ever since i've ever since that got put in my ear i have just been intrigued by it and, yeah and been wanting to dive in and i haven't it's it's the monroe institute has been a topic on i have a sheet that of 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 different topics that i'm i'm very interested in that i want to interview people about and and on the same sheet is a list of names. It's like a dream list of who I want to interview. Yeah, Monroe, is, Monroe Institute and remote viewing has been on there. It was one of the first things I put on the list. And then we had a conversation um, and about somebody else yeah. who you were prompting me to kind of get on the show, and I hope that happens. And then we got into a detailed conversation, and I was just—I was—it was—it just felt I was like, "Hey, you got to get in here. We got to do this. <laughs> we got to do this." Yeah. And uh, so, thank you for coming, man. Thanks for having me back, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's—it's. It's, uh, I know this one's just going to be just as. I love this topic. <sighs> me too. So, <clears throat> let's get into. Let's just get right into it. Let's. What is the Monroe Institute? So the Monroe Institute is one of the, if not the premier research institutes for consciousness expansion. And on the East Coast, at least, if not in the country. Now, that begs the question, okay, so what is consciousness? And consciousness is that place within us that we observe from. It's a separate space from our minds because like if we talked about the last episode we talked about one characteristic one phenomenon of consciousness versus our mind's knowledge 
if we can take our consciousness and see what our mind is doing with our emotions and stuff like that, see our mind in operation, that proves that consciousness is separate from our mind. And so we're not exactly sure. We don't have a complete definition of what consciousness is. No one agrees on the definition of consciousness. There are a lot of scientists out there that say consciousness is an emergent property of the complex system of our brains, and if our brains weren't there, we wouldn't have consciousness. And while that's true to a point, it doesn't necessarily say that consciousness is just in our brains. And I feel that the evidence that science is putting forward is that consciousness is actually out beyond our bodies as well as something that we experience through our bodies. But it, when you reach out out of your body into consciousness, you can do things like remote viewing and to uh, see into the future, to discern information, which, by the way, comes from a study that was done 90 times in 33 different independent labs in 14 different countries that showed human beings can literally look into the future regarding a task that they're doing now. Well, expansion out into that consciousness is that practice of taking your mind and going out beyond your body to find out the cool things that you can do with it and the cool things that you can experience with it and the new things that you can learn and the ways that you can use it for things like remote viewing. And so Monroe is that place that <clears throat> helps develop technology to help humans expand that consciousness out beyond their body and do really cool things with it. So they have, you know, the, they, they invented this hemisync technology that everybody's talking about. Um, they're the place that the CIA had that report out on, on the internet that was, you know, popular on social media just recently of, you know, the, the gateway tapes and the gateway protocol. They invented that. And that's what the government was using and, uh, experimenting with and researching regarding expansion of consciousness using the human's innate ability to reach out beyond the body into consciousness to do cool stuff. That's what Moreau is. Are they just into, I shouldn't say just, but is the focus remote viewing or is there other, other aspects of consciousness that they're researching as well? There are other aspects. They're number one in remote viewing because of their history of helping to develop a training program for the CIA and, and military industrial um, remote viewers that they developed the program for, they trained the people in the government who were remote viewers for a number of years before they actually had their own program set up internally. Um, so that's kind of their, their pedigree and their history is being the top place that trained all the remote viewers and, and put together a training program that allowed for people to do that kind of cool stuff. Uh, but then they branched out into other stuff, like Bob Monroe, who started the Monroe Institute, who's no longer with us. He was interested in all kinds of cool stuff and the utilization of technology to expand consciousnesses in multiple places. So now they got courses on how to reach out and, and communicate with extraterrestrial entities, like, you know, some crazy fringe stuff. But they also have other stuff like how to train yourself for potentially having out-of-body experiences and extending your consciousness out to go see things, not in a remote viewing fashion, but to go see other places and other things that aren't local to your uh, body consciousness. And they've got all kinds of stuff. And they, they do some, I mean, it's almost um, like a, a philanthropy or a, a, an outreach to Spirits, one of their programs reaches out to lost souls that haven't found their way to their final destination after their death. They're confused about, you know, where they are and what happened. And yeah, 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 they lost their life suddenly and they're just wandering around. And they have a program that's designed to help go out and reach those folks and lead them into a place where they can, you know, finally get to their final destination. It's like, and, and there's science up there that helps validate a lot of what they're doing in the physical realm to say there are, there's evidence that proves that this stuff is effective. There's evidence, and like in the case of Joe McMonigle, who was remote viewer number one for the Army Intelligence and CIA program that they put together, his evidence is irrefutable. Like that's on government record that he did all this stuff and was able to go to other places from his living room in Virginia and then out an entire nuclear uh, sub-program for the Russian military where he was the only one in the room who drew the sub with all of these characteristics, and, and then it proved to be completely accurate. And he drew it from his living room in Virginia. That is the most remarkable, when we spoke on the phone, yeah. and you told me about that, that, was, that is the most remarkable remote viewing 
piece of information I've ever heard. That's not even and his best one, but it's pretty impressive. You want me to tell the story? Not yet. We'll get to that. Okay. We'll get to that. I want to stick with, with the Monroe Institute, Bob Monroe. Yeah. And <clears throat> how long has the Monroe Institute been around? Since the 60s, I believe. Since the 60s? Yeah. How did... So I'm, I'm very interested in what you know. So the, the, the Central Intelligence Agency, CIA, and the Monroe Institute collaborated. A substantial amount of money was poured into the Monroe Institute to research. Is it research and develop, or did it start with research with, with remote viewing? Well, the story that I got on the origin of Monroe Institute was that Bob Monroe was just simply interested in trying to figure out what technologies could assist with consciousness expansion. And he put together some programs, and all they had were gateway experiences back in the day. And um, What is a gateway experience? So the gateway is Bob's method of introducing binaural frequencies to where, for instance, you have 100 hertz in one ear and 104 hertz in the other ear. You can hear them both, but you can't hear 4 hertz normally. It's below our audible level. But if you put two signals in your ears right and left that have a difference of 4 hertz, your brain then starts activating in a way to try to resolve that, and it turns on things because that's specifically right in the delta and theta uh, transition area, and it can turn on experiences in your mind that would not normally be turned on in your consciousness. And so it gives you different experiences of consciousness. And so um, he started to experiment with that kind of technology, and that program, the gateway, was introducing people into different levels of consciousness where you could experience deeper levels of concentration aided by the technology that they were putting in headphones, right? And so there's this guy, um, Skip, who was instructed to put together the remote viewing program for the military and CIA because they were getting reports that Russia was doing the same thing, that they were using psychics to look inside the secrets of the United States. So they needed to do an analysis of what kind of risk they were talking about and whether the United States should also investigate that type of technology. Russia's doing this too. Yeah, Russia was doing it at the time and we were getting reports about it. So they were ahead of us on this. Yeah. Is anybody else doing this that you're aware of? Uh, I, from what I understand, although no one would admit it, every major country in the United States is implementing this type of program. Or excuse me, every, every major country in the world is implementing, is implementing this, like every first world nation is implementing this in their intelligence communities. Wow. Yeah, but no one wants to talk about it because first of all, it's woo woo crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and second, you, know, you don't want to identify your best viewers because for instance, like Joe was attempted to assassinate three times. Hey, you know what? People listening right now that think this is woo-woo, do a Google search, do a DuckDuckGo search, do a whatever the hell you want search, and just Google Monroe Institute, CIA, and the shit's going to come up. Yeah. So yeah, there you go. For all of you people that still believe in, you know, that the, 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 the <laughs> you know, you got to hear it from a, from a government source, Yeah. which I, I can't believe... Whatever, but uh, <laughs> there it is. It's right there. Yeah, I mean, they they invested millions of dollars in Monroe. Skip, uh, their old uh, program director for remote viewing, came down and was just researching, you know, trying to figure out what a what a training program might look like for a remote viewer. Um, how do you expand somebody's consciousness, or how do you increase their level of uh, psychic abilities is, you know, and this is crazy stuff that they were investigating back then, but they wanted to make sure they weren't investing money in a bad way or they weren't wasting it on charlatans, that type of thing. So he would go out to these places and, and investigate them. And, uh, Bob basically took him around, gave him a tour, but put him in a radio shielded room with a pair of headphones on, started playing some tones in his ears and Skip started floating up out of his body. So he thought that was pretty interesting. And so he put Monroe on a short list of places to investigate after he identified some folks who could uh, possibly be good remote viewers. And so then um, he devised the idea that he said, okay, so we're looking for folks in the intelligent community. How do we find, you know, who, who might be the psychics? 
and he looked for folks who were in their jobs longer than they should be. Because he thought, just as a common sense perspective, if these people are tuned into something extra, it's gonna be the folks who are surviving longer in a shorter life expectancy job because they're making the right choices at the right times to stay alive. And it just so happened that um, Joe McMonagle, who was remote viewer number one, he had spent 14 years in the field as an operative. And he was in a job that the life expectancy was 20 months, and he had spent 14 years in that job. So they yanked him in and started interrogating him to ask him to you know, see if he was a double agent and was getting fed information on the other side. And when they figured out he wasn't, they sent him to Stanford Research Institute for testing, where Russell Targ and Hal Putoff, uh, which I'm sure those names will ring some bells for folks who are interested in extraterrestrial stuff, because Hal's at the top of that chain as well. Um, Hal Putoff and, and Russell Targ were developing a program to try to test remote viewers, and they sent Joe McMonagall out there, and he tested off the charts. He nailed every one of their tests except for one, and he got a second place result on the last one. What, what are some of these tests? So <clears throat> basically the tests were, we have a target, you don't know who it is, and that target through a double blind process has been instructed to go to a location. The target doesn't know where the, the target's a person, the target doesn't know where the location is until they're handed the envelope to tell them to go there. The targets have been randomized and put in envelopes and then a dice gets rolled for a randomization to, to select where they're going. And they're, they're, the two people are never in the same room. They don't know each other. The remote viewer goes in a radio shielded room that's separated in a different building. And the target, randomized location, they get the envelope, they open it up, they go there. And so then it's the job of the remote viewer to say, okay, your target is at a location. Tell us about the location. And that's it, that's all they get. So then the remote viewer goes into a little bit of a meditation to clear their mind. And um, Joe's explanation of remote viewing is like, is you imagine a cardboard door in front of you and you poke a hole in it. And you don't see the whole picture, but you start to see a little bit of it. And you get the, the little pieces of information about things. And he started drawing what he saw on the target location. And he would nail, um, and now here's the, here's the process of how a, a separate viewing gets viewed. It's a separate judge who isn't connected with the experiment at all, except he's judging the remote viewing versus multiple targets that could exist. So he doesn't know where the target is either. He gets a randomized selection inside a stack of targets, and he has to take the drawing that the remote viewer has made and the information that the remote viewer has written down, like any smells or any sounds or any uh, images or what's you know the shape of a building or something like that. And then he has to, he or she has to take that remote drawing viewing, remote viewing drawing, and then match it to a number of things that are before him. So he doesn't know the target. He doesn't know the location. He doesn't, has, doesn't uh, had contact with the remote viewer or the target. He just takes a drawing and matches it to a bunch of stuff on a wall. And he says, okay, this looks the most like this. It's got this pattern that he drew. It's got this uh, smell of this flower that's in the picture. It's got, you know, whatever it is. And then at that point, you're graded. And if that independent judge has taken the remote viewer's information and matched it to the correct target, that's a first place uh, finish, first place result. And Joe hit first place result after first place result after first place result. And they sent him to Meade <laughs> at that point to start the remote viewing program. And now he didn't really believe it. <clears throat> he thought this whole thing was an operation on him. Like how gullible is this guy? Like, can we string him along? How long is he gonna be strung along for that we're telling him he's psychic? Um, although he kind of knew he was psychic because he'd get hints about operations in the jungle and he was all throughout Vietnam and he's gone to 110 countries. He's a legit field operative. <clears throat> so he's getting drops. He's going in and talking to tribal chiefs, making uh, treaties and stuff like that. Like he's a legit operator. As a parent, my number one priority above everything else is my kids' well-being. I just want to see them chase their dreams, 
experience all life's adventures, and really, I just want them to thrive in today's world. But as a parent, I know that life can be unpredictable, and that is important to plan for the unexpected so that my kids can thrive in this world no matter what life throws at us. Fabric was designed by parents for parents to help you get a high quality, surprisingly affordable term life insurance policy in less than 10 minutes. Get your personalized quote in just minutes and then apply when it's convenient for you. It's all online and all on your schedule. You could go from start to covered in less than 10 minutes with no health exam required. With over 1,700 five-star reviews, they're rated as excellent on Trustpilot. Fabric has more than just life insurance. Their easy digital platform also lets you create wills, access college savings funds, and manage your family's finances right from your phone. So your family is prepared for anything. Join the thousands of parents who trust Fabric to protect their family. Apply today in just minutes at meetfabric.com slash Sean. That's meetfabric.com slash Sean. M-E-E-T fabric.com slash Sean. Policies issued by Western Southern Life Assurance Company, not available in certain states. Prices subject to underwriting and health questions. I don't talk much about money or the economy, but let's face it, ignoring it doesn't help either. Because I believe the government screws up all the time. I think they let down veterans, ship jobs overseas, they help their rich friends make even more money. It is insane. Do you really think they care about helping us out with our money? I don't think so. That's one of the reasons why a lot of folks are stepping away from the government-run systems and starting to diversify their money into real assets like gold and silver. If you're concerned about your finances and the future of your finances like I am, there's a damn good play you can make. Check out Gold Co. Gold Co. will hook you up with a free 2023 Gold IRA kit. This kit will teach you how to help safeguard your savings with real gold and silver, at the very least, it makes sense to get educated about your options. So get your free kit at goldco.com slash Ryan or call 855-936-GOLD. Plus, for qualified orders, they'll send you up to $10,000 in free silver as a bonus while supplies last. Quit waiting around for politicians to rescue your finances, help take control, and handle your business yourself. So go ahead and check out goldco.com slash Ryan or call 855-936-GOLD to get your free kit today. Just remember, performance may vary and always consult with a financial professional before making any investment decisions. You've heard the buzz about ketone supplements and how they can boost your workouts by helping your body use fatty acids for fuel. I take a shot of HVMN ketone supplement before my morning workout. It's focused energy. It's not an energy drink though. It's like a feeling of being in the zone. I don't feel hyper jittery, anxiety, stuff like I get when I drink too much coffee. They're great for cycling, long runs, and all kinds of workouts, and can help you stay sharper on a regular basis. We also just received some exciting news. In addition to being available in select Equinox gyms, Ketone IQ can now be found in local Sprout stores nationwide. I wish I'd had this product when I was on active duty. I get better endurance, I don't get the crash, and it helps curb my appetite. HVMN is offering my audience 30% off your first subscription order of Ketone IQ. You can save 30% off your first subscription order of Ketone IQ at hvmn.com slash Sean. Again, visit hvmn.com slash Sean and subscribe upon checkout for 30% off. So he gets sent to Mead and he, he doesn't quite believe that, you know, he doesn't understand what this remote viewing is all about yet because he's brand new to the program. He's brand new to this experiment that they're trying to put together. So he tries to test himself on Skylab in 1978, I think. It's coming down from, uh, this is the first USS uh, space station base, uh, like the, the International Space Station. There was a Skylab version of it back in the late 70s, except it ran out of juice and they couldn't use it anymore and um, it 
was going to come down out of orbit and fall down and break apart, but not quite burn up. And so they were really worried that major chunks of this, like refrigerator size stuff, was going to come down and land on somebody's head. Telemetry, telemetry wasn't what it is today, so they had no idea where this thing was coming down or when it was coming down. They just knew it was coming down. It was in a decaying orbit, and eventually it was going to enter the atmosphere and could land literally anywhere on the planet. And they didn't know. And so he was like, all right, I'm going to test myself on this. He said, if I have an opportunity to fail, this is it. Because no one knows where this thing is coming down. And so I'll just go into my remote viewing process that I'm being taught how to do this, go into a meditation, see if I can figure this out. <clears throat> and he came up with a date and he came up with a location. So this, as far as the scientists were concerned, they were like, okay, well, this is going to land somewhere. This is going to re-enter somewhere in this six-month time frame is the best guess. Six, what year is this? Do you know? It's like, I think it's like 78. Yeah, so it was back then before they had a bunch of awesome telemetry to know exactly where something was in space. Now they're tracking all kinds of things that are this big in our orbit. So they, so they, they have a six-month window. Yeah, basically. They're like it's going to land somewhere. Do they have a hemisphere? No. They just know it's going to hit the Earth in a six-month time frame. Okay. Yeah, because where when it comes down will definitely determine where it lands on the planet, right? If if it goes an extra five minutes in orbit, well, it could be another whole another continent because of the speed that it's going, right? It's up in order, but like seventeen thousand miles an hour or whatever. So, um, so he wrote down a date and he wrote down. He walked up and put a pin on the map, and the pin on the map happened to be in. Australia, and the date he missed by six days. So the date was close, but the pin that he put on the map, he missed the location of reentry by 30 miles, which statistically is one in 6,656,000. It's like hitting the lottery numbers on your first try to be able to identify where Skylab came down. If you were standing on the location where he put the pin in the map, you could look up and literally see Skylab breaking up in front of you. Wow. So Hal Putoff said it was the best remote viewing of a future event that he'd ever seen, and I think still since, being able to identify where this thing was gonna come down out of orbit. And so at that point, Joe thought, okay, well maybe this, maybe I'll stick with this remote viewing thing for a while. <laughs> <laughs> What sparked, what was the, what was the event that sparked CIA's interest in all of this? <clears throat> well, I think they were just motivated to try to investigate whether this had any merit for intelligence gathering and for operational information. Was it Russia? Yeah. Russia, Russia's capability with remote viewing is what sparked the United States to Central Intelligence Agency to start looking into this. Yeah. How much money did they dump into this program? We don't know exactly. Um, Joe personally told me over a lunch, millions. So more than one, officially. I don't know how many millions, but um, it was very important for the United States to be able to investigate whether or not this had intelligence capabilities and what level of benefit that could be gleaned from investigating this type of of because they started getting amazing viewings out of Joe right away. And it's like, okay, well, how many amazing LeBron James of consciousness are there um, to say, you know, this person can sit in a room and tell me what's going on at a location and potential future events? Because some of the remote viewers that the CIA used were able to produce the effects of nuclear tests that had been secret until the remote viewer said, this is going to happen be able to figure out whether it was going to be a success or a failure because some of them were failures um, and all the intelligence turned out to be correct. And so they were super interested. Joe McMonagall never missed the location of a nuclear sub in his entire career because he, he explains that there's a high level of entropy in a reactor for a sub and that just glows like a big bright light in consciousness where those locations of those types of entropy events are. So if, if anyone ever needed to know, like they lost track of where a nucle nuclear sub was for the Russians, they'd go into Joe's office and he goes, right here. And they'd check their sensors and boom, it would be there. Well, since we're talking about nuclear subs and Joe McMonagall, let's tell me the story. Yeah. 
<clears throat> well, the one that made everyone sit up and take notice and got them more funding for a large number of years was when there was a building that was identified by intelligence personnel that became the top priority for the National Security Council. It was the largest building under one roof in the world. And it was high in the Russian tundra near this uh, large body of water. So they thought it might be a manufacturing facility for some type of military craft. And they weren't sure what it was. And everybody wanted to know what was going on inside the building because they had triple death wire fencing. In between all those, they had sentries with dogs, uh, 24 hour site to site sentry circle uh, around the property. Trains coming in, dumping off raw materials 24 seven. Food coming in, food service for the people who are working inside the building and no one knew what was going on inside the building. And so someone at the National Security Council meetings knew that they had a, a new psychic program down at Meade and sent the manila folder down to um, Fort Meade and they handed it to Joe McMonagall. The first thing they handed him was simply map coordinates. And they said, show us what you see here. And he came up with the building that they were concerned about. And he, and he described the building and they said, okay, you're on target. And then they gave him a picture of that building and they said, tell us what's going on inside here. Now the guys in the National Security Council and all the intelligence guys who were in the room came to the consensus that <clears throat> um, it was gonna be some kind of troop carrier uh, that they could probably transport over to the ocean because it was four or five blocks away from the ocean, but it was short enough to where they could transport something a medium size over to the ocean to get it into the water. Um, but that was their best guess. Joe McMonagall was the only person who came up with the result. He dropped into the building and he started viewing this thing and he viewed it over a number of uh, days and came up with a drawing and an explanation and technical specifications for a brand new submarine. And he said, this is the biggest submarine in the world by far. It's one and a half times bigger than the next biggest sub. This is the brand new classification of Russian sub. And he came up with a number of very unique characteristics for that sub. <clears throat> and he said, it's not a cylinder. It's a cylinder that looks like it's cut in half, spread out, and then a flat part welded on the top and the bottom. And the US engineers looked at that later after he sent it and he said, that's impossible. It'd be crushed at depth. You know, it's highly unlikely, et cetera. But then he added the specifications. It's got a special drive um, propulsion system that I, I don't want to say too much about, uh, but it's also got canted launch tubes, which means it can fire nuclear missiles on the run without having to stop, which could give us about 20 minutes warning that we're going to lose 1,200 cities. So this is the first strike weapon. And it's, by the way, if you've seen the movie Hunt for Red October, that submarine that they used in that movie was the sub that Joe McMonagall outed. <laughs> he said it's almost two football fields long, it's 75 feet wide, it's seven stories tall. He drew, and he's got a video of this where that he sent up to the National Security Council. He drew a diagram of the sub with its specifications, with its very interesting uh, technical advancements that the United States didn't have on their subs. And he's got the original tape that he, that he submitted to the NSC, and this has been declassified so he can share it now. So this is the tape that he reported up to the NSC before the thing was launched um, and, and proved him correct. But he sent all that up, and Robert Gates was the guy who is collecting all the information for the people disseminating the information for the National Security Council, didn't even let it through. Really? Yeah, because he's like, this came from a psychic. And I'm like, yeah, and he's like, he looked at it, and he like, looked at the report, and he's like, okay, the sub, the, the engineers said the sub can't survive at depth. Um, it's way too big. He's the only guy who thinks it's a sub. It's not, they're not gonna be able to roll this off into the water, there's no water there, and they, it's too big to transport over to the ocean. So he wrote, total fantasy on top of the report and sent it back to Joe at Mead. Joe is not pleased. <laughs> he's a little bit of an attitude and he's a really good operative who's now just been put into this remote viewing thing where she's had some success in. And he's like, I know this is a sub. And so he took that total fantasy remark and he wrote under it, 
he went back into a, a meditation and he looked at the sub again. He looked how far along was it, and he made an estimation of how long it was going to take to launch this thing. And he goes, "Yeah, well, your total fantasy launches in 112 days." Sent it back to Robert Gates at me or at uh, the Pentagon. How did that go? <laughs> <laughs> well, Robert Gates has a little bit of an ego. The good news is someone at the National Reconnaissance Office picked up this pissing match, and they were curious. And so they tasked a satellite to do a flyover at 114 days from that date that he said 112 days. And they snapped pictures of the Red October submarine, seven stories high, 75 feet wide, almost two football fields long, canted launch tubes, special propulsion, the whole thing. He nailed it all. Are you serious? Yeah. Two cylinders separated with flat pieces in between right next to a brand new, right in a brand new canal that they built right next to the building in from the sea so they could roll it off into the water. So they built a canal in the four months that he said they were gonna launch it in and just dumped it into the, into the canal right next to the building. So that was interesting. And they were two days into, they had all their hatches wide open because they were loading uh, reactor cores and missiles two days into the process of loading missiles. So he nailed it to the day, including all the specifications and no one believed him. And it was one of the greatest information gathering operations for any launch of any Russian equipment since and to this day. I would imagine that sparked a lot of interest in remote viewing in Robert Gates. <laughs> in Robert Gates' mind. How so what in in and I'm sure a lot of other minds and organizations. So what what happened after this? So the fringe folks who were starting to investigate remote viewing and sending tasks down to Meade became most of the intelligence agencies in the United States government started overtasking the remote viewers down there. So they got crushed. How many remote viewers were there? Um, there were a bunch. I mean, there were four or five that they, they had as a stable, and then they were trying out other um, individuals, bringing people in, letting people go, because they were like less effective. Um, but it was a constant barrage of life or death situations. Tell us what you can see. Um, these are special operations that are going live. Tell us which way we need to turn. What's going on? Somebody just got kidnapped. We got probably 18 hours before he's dead. Uh, help figure out where he went. Uh, a lot of missing people and missing operators. Uh, to tell us where he is, we'll go get him. And uh, that was that was taxing on a lot of those remote viewers, and they got burned out pretty quick. And so that that's where help from Neuro Institute stepped in to help provide a training program that could give them a faster cool down and a deeper focus on being able to get good information in a quicker time so that they didn't have to spend so much time prepping and meditation to be able to get in and get a good viewing on something. How long are these guys spending in meditation? Um, well, it depends on the viewer, um, but you could do, uh, like in the, in the early days, I think Joe told me he was spending, you know, 45 minutes to an hour to try to figure out a place where he could get to where he could get a, a good bit of information. Um, but in his later years, after he was practiced, and this is why plasticity matters here, where your brain changes in form and function to help you do, like you, you play the piano, and then all of a sudden you get better at playing the piano because your brain just gets used to it, and he says, okay, I need to play the piano better. Shooting baskets, you get that muscle memory, well, that's your brain changing to help you shoot those baskets better and just drain the three. Um, doing crossword puzzles, your brain will change in form and function to help you do the crossword puzzles faster. Well, it turns out remote viewing is the same way. Um, later in his life, uh, when he was doing remote viewing, like for one example, he got a call one night when he was in Las Vegas from the local sheriff who was looking for a missing child. And the mom thought the child was with dad and the dad thought the child was with mom and it's getting dark when they figured out the child is missing and it's in Virginia wilderness and in the county in which um, Joe lived and there's, there's wild animals and it's getting cold at night and the kids may not make it. He got a call in the middle of the night by the sheriff who's like, let's get the psychic on the phone. 
And um, Joe immediately picked up the phone, closed his eyes for like five seconds, and then basically told the sheriff, he goes, send your deputy out this road to this particular location. Have him stop the car, get out of the car, get his compass out. And at 318 degrees on his compass, I want you to walk 1,209 steps. Stop, call the child's name out, and he will respond. And that was like within five, 10 seconds of getting the call and asking, you know, what the details were. And then he gave a reading. And so the, he goes back to bed thinking, okay, hopefully they're going to find the kid. If they follow his directions, they will. About five minutes later, 10 minutes later, you get the, another call in his hotel room and he's pissed because it's ringing the phone in the middle of the night again. So he gets up, grabs the phone. Hello, Joe. We sent our officer out there to the spot where you said, and he pulled out his compass. And he, but this officer just said he got back from training last week regarding missing children. And he said, the statistics are that kids 10 and under will not walk up a hill when they're lost. But he's looking at his compass reading and it goes directly up a, a steep hill. What do you want us to do? And his answer was immediate. He's like, do what I told you to do, click. <laughs> and so then another five, 10 minutes goes by and he gets another call and he picks up the phone a little softer this time because I think he had a feeling that they found him. He's like, did you find him? And she goes, yes, Joe, thank you very much. Good night. And so the officer, against his training, went up the hill, 1,209 steps, followed the directions, stopped where he was, called out the child's name, and the kid answered him because he had walked up the hill to get to a cabin, and he was sleeping on the back porch sofa of a cabin that was deserted at the time, but it had a, a light on. And he was a five-year-old kid, and he said, my daddy said, if I ever got lost, walk to the closest light and stay there. And so he went up the hill and was sleeping on the back porch of that cabin. And Joe sent that state trooper up the hill, called out his name, and the kid woke up and answered him. Wow. And it took literally five seconds for him to get the original viewing to, and that, all that stuff's like documented, right? I mean, these aren't, you know, oh, bullshit, you know, made up stories. Like he's got legitimate government records, you know, and he was awarded the Legion of Merit after retiring for all of the stuff and all the aid that he was, all the operational intelligence that he provided that saved people's lives. So it's, it's possible to reach out beyond your regular physiology and see things that aren't local to you because consciousness is out beyond our body. And you just have to be able to project yours to see other places and other things. And the more you do it, the better you get at it. The more you practice it, the better you can do it. And the more reliable it is. As much as I want to keep talking about Joe McMonagle. Yeah. It's going to be where we have a collaborative effort here yes. to get him in the studio to tell his story. And I am very much hoping and praying that that happens. I just saw him because I just got back from from uh, Monroe Institute, and I think he wants to come on. We're going to try to figure out how to get that done. He doesn't travel so well, so maybe we have to might figure something out. But um, he, he knows who you are and likes you and likes the show, and so that kind of helped. Uh, but you know, he's a guy that when he calls the Pentagon, the Pentagon picks up the phone and says, "Yes, Joe." Um, so he's, you know, he's one of those untouchable guys. He's an amazing get. I'd love to have him come here and, and hang out and talk with you because his stories are amazing. And he is a real deal. He's a national treasure of what he's done for the United States and United States intelligence with his abilities. Well, we're going to do everything we can. So, and uh, I really hope that happens. But you are now an official ambassador of the Monroe Institute. You've done some of this testing. You're getting into, Mon uh, not Monroe Institute, you're getting into remote viewing. Yeah. And so how did you, how did you get involved with the Monroe Institute? It was in my research to try to figure out what consciousness was and how it worked that I ran into a documentary that included Joe in it called Third Eye Spies. And it was about how Russell Targ and Hal Putoff put together the remote viewing programs 
for the government back in the day. And it was a story about the origin and what they did to try to create uh, remote viewing training program and testing and, um, you know, put a scientific method behind the whole thing. And then they, in the latter part of that documentary, they interviewed Joe and had him on there and told a couple of stories about his accolades. And um, it was through that that I found out he was still alive, that he was still teaching remote viewing. And I was like, that's amazing. I want to go meet this guy and see what this is all about. Because if I'm writing a book about consciousness, and I believe that it goes on beyond the body, I want to go meet a guy who's actually proven it. And so um, I got signed up for his course and went up to Monroe, took his remote viewing course, and that was amazing, by the way, because not only did he go through the double-blind protocol and how to clear your mind and what you're looking for and how to just take whatever your mind is giving you and put it on the paper and don't judge it and don't name it, um, just take the raw information, the raw data, and put it down and then let somebody else judge if you've hit the target or not. Um, through that process, people who are brand new to remote viewing in the class were blowing their own minds on how well they could see things they had no idea about. Because you got to understand, when you go up there to do a remote viewing, uh, remote, excuse me, a remote viewing course, all they give you is a reference number. They give you a blank sheet of paper and they say, "B forty three, go." That's it. What no is clues. that? What is B forty three? It's what the that fucking mean? number on the envelope of the image that you're supposed to look into the envelope and see what's in there. So you, so when day one, week one, at yeah. Mon, at the Monroe Institute for remote viewing, you get an envelope with a photograph. You don't even get the envelope. You can't touch it. They you say, can't touch it. they say they've got a stack of envelopes up front and then they say, okay, you're, and then not, and not everybody gets the same one. They say your name, and then they give you a reference number out of their stack of envelopes is up the, up the front. And so you get a, a letter and a number or just sometimes a number or just sometimes a couple of letters or whatever it is. And that's it. That's all you get. And then you start to, you start to close your eyes and you start to envision what are you getting from a, a hearing sensation, a taste sensation. What, just what is it that your mind is giving you at that moment? And you try to record it on the piece of paper. And that's it. That's all they give you is just a reference number. Without any of these technologies, this is, no. this is bare bones. Yeah. No frequency work, nothing. Yeah. Because they start with a, just a blind read, and then they start to implement the, the technology of the, the, the signals in the headphones and stuff like that, so you can see the difference, see how it improves your ability to, to view and your results, et cetera. But from Go, they just give you a number, and they say, start drawing. So walk me through this process. What? So you get, you get your reference number. Yep, you get your reference number, and then you're supposed to quiet your mind and see if you can clear whatever's going on in your mind for a moment, the thoughts. And then you look for, show me the target that's associated with B43 or whatever your reference number was. And then your mind starts to do whatever it does and whatever it gives you, you try to record that and you try to remain on your target. Like you don't think about lunch tomorrow, you don't think about conversation you had with somebody earlier in the day, you don't think about um, you know, whatever it is that your mind wants to go to, you're focusing on the target. You want the information about the target. If your mind starts to wander, you just say, target. And whatever your mind gives you, that's the remote viewing. And sometimes you'll hit it, sometimes you won't, but you draw whatever it is that your mind gives you. So what was your mind giving you? My first remote viewing ever, which convinced me that it was real. I was in uh, my check unit doing my drawing, and this is a little place of a little cubby hole that you go and sit so you can be by yourself and focus on your own thoughts so that no sounds distract you, et cetera, no light comes in if you don't want it. Um, I flashed in front of my, well, my mind flashed in front of my vision with my eyes closed, the idea of a, like a round spider web. Is the best thing that I could, and your brain will equate some things to be as close as, like whatever it shows you, it'll be close to, but maybe not exactly what it was. So I just saw like a spider web, and I saw multiple lines going out from the center, and I saw multiple lines connecting the 
lines that were going out, so it kind of looked like a spider web. But then in the middle, there was a big blotch of opaque material, whatever it was, I don't know. So basically I drew it like a spider web with a big old dot in the middle of it, scribble, 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 and that's all that I got. So we go back down after the doing our drawings to the room where they handed us our target. And the first target, everybody does the same because they have it on a, a slide that they're gonna show. Um, so you come in there and you they say, okay, you're gonna be remote viewing and they gave you a reference number, but everybody gets the same reference number. You go off and you draw whatever it was. <clears throat> and then they show you everyone in the next slide what it is. And the next slide that they showed was, and they have a standard database that they pull from. These are images that are used for testing remote viewing and they're all randomly selected usually. So um, no one can cheat, no one knows what's gonna come up, you know, that type of thing. But this one is the first one they gave us. So they had it on the slide. And the next thing that they showed us was a white background with black pen illustration of an old Ferris wheel from the 1920s that had a number of lines going out from the center. And where the lines got too thick for the pen, the, the, the lines converged, there was a huge black dot where the, the pen lines all just kind of merged together into a bunch of ink. And I looked down at this spider web with this black dot in the middle of it. And it wasn't exactly, because I drew a spider web because that's what was presented to me in my mind. But it was a goddamn circle with a bunch of connecting lines and a big dot in the middle of it, just like the frame was. What, what was uh? I mean, what what are you? What's going through your head at this point? Holy shit! <laughs> <laughs> That's. I mean, yeah. I'm freaking. I'm freaking out. Like I'm like, you know, I, I'm going. I'm going to remote viewing at at Monroe, and I'm like, you know, I first of all, I don't expect to be able to do anything at mm -hmm. all. Yeah. Because I've never done it before. Um, I don't know what happens here. I don't know anything about remote viewing. I'm just up here basically to meet this amazing guy. And um, so I'm not expecting anything. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I've never done this before. I don't even know if it's real. Uh, because, you know, I mean, who knows? Could this whole Joe McMonagall thing be a complete disinformation campaign to try to lead foreign intelligence down the wrong road and have them waste time on psychics and all this other stuff? It's going through my mind. And then I drew 80 to 90% of the first image, first try out of the gate. And I thought that was interesting. And then maybe that was just a lucky guess. And what happened after that, all throughout the week, is that I kept getting first place results. Viewing after viewing after viewing. And again, this is the same process that they use where you get a randomized reference number that's unique to you. You go and you draw whatever you get. And then you're handing it to another person who's a judge who has to then take four images, random images, and say, okay, you're drawing best matches this thing. And I kept putting out imaging, I kept putting out drawings that would match the right one. Because only one of the, the distractors on the paper would be the actual target. And they would have to say, this matches, because they didn't know which one it was, this matches this image. And that was the target, time after time. And I was just like, that's crazy. And so this what, is real. What, what are these, one, how long did it take you to come up with the spider web? Almost immediately. It was the first thing that flashed in my, when I closed my eyes, that spider web kind of like out of the darkness flashed in a white light in front of my face. Was like and a, that's it. That was it. That was that was big. And then you drew it, and that's it. Yeah. That's well, it kept end. it kept flashing. Like I kept I kept because I I was doubting it. Mm -hmm. Like I was like bullshit. This isn't it. It's not a spider web. Like, You're like all right, f it. I'm just gonna draw this spider web. Yeah. Like, basically. Basically. Like total it, disbelief. It wouldn't go away. It kept flashing in front of my face. I tried to draw up other stuff which is a whole another process that you're not supposed to do, which I didn't know, but he taught us later. He's like, don't do that, don't do this, you know, don't put any meaning to it, don't put an analytical overlay that you think this is an apple or whatever, just do, just take the basic information that you're given, 
because you know the the shape, although it might look an, like an apple to you, might be something else. So don't draw an apple if it kind of looks like an apple, but it's two separated uh, C's that are opposite. That kind of looks like an apple to you. Don't draw an apple. Just draw what you see, the two opposite C's, because it might be something else. So uh, yeah, I just I tried to push it out and it wouldn't go away, and I was like. All right, well, this is wrong. Whatever. <laughs> Doesn't really matter. I didn't come up here to succeed. I came up here to meet this guy. And um, and then it turned out to be right. And I was just I was blown away. I mean, you obviously impressed the Monroe Institute. Yeah. Well, I mean, I did good in remote viewing, but a lot of people do good in remote viewing. I mean, you might be surprised. Joe will tell you right off the bat, everyone has this capability. It's whether or not you use it. And, and the, the thing that people call the sixth sense, he says, is the first sense. Like, that's the way we grew out of the bush and developed and evolved. That sixth sense was the first sense that could keep you out of danger and keep you surviving in the wild. Like, when you knew that there was a big cat in that bush or whatever it was that was going to kill you, and you stayed away from it and you survived. He says that's the first sense. That's how he survived 14 years in a 20-month life expectancy uh, position in intelligence, is that he just followed his hunches, he followed his gut. Um, he told us a story the other day, it was amazing. He went out, at the end of his career, he was sent out to do a drop with a Russian agent, and um, he was sent along with a guy who was an administrator inside intelligence, but had never had done any field work. And they, they got to Greece where they were going, <clears throat> And the guy had made a reservation down at the beach of a really nice resort, and he goes, we can't go there. That place is going to be bombed. And they went on, and the guy screwed up the operation, and Joe got, wound up getting the drop because he identified the guy and got the drop. And then they came and were about to get ready to leave for the airport to go fly back, and a bomb went off in that hotel with <laughs> the reservations. Right? So that kind of stuff, you're, you're, we're wired into as human beings. Yeah, because it's part of consciousness. It's what helps bring consciousness into our body. Is a larger field of conscious energy that you can reach out into and sense other things that are outside your body and outside space and time, like into the future, which is how he was able to predict the uh, coming down of the Skylab. I mean, uh, the, uh, the bomb story. I can. I mean, I can relate to in my fourteen years of operations within, you know, the different SEAL teams, the agency. All that. I mean, you, there is a feeling, you know, that you do get when things are about to happen, and uh, so I can understand that. <clears throat> yeah. Somewhat. Yeah. But well, he says everybody's tagged into this, like everybody's connected into it. It's whether or not you use it and whether or not you exercise it that where you can actually get better at it or not. And so, you know, you you go through this week. And you get a little more confidence and you're a little bit more trusting in the process. And all of a sudden, most of the class is nailing their assignments and remote viewing. No kidding. I so mean, this, it's amazing. So most, I was actually, that was a question of mine. I wanted to know how many people were in your group, roughly. Yeah, and, roughly about 20. And, and I'd say about 14 or 15 of them were nailing first class or first, uh, uh, first place results most of the time. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there was a, a bunch of seconds and a bunch of thirds uh, where people, you know, and, and even Joe misses sometimes other world-class remote viewers. Sometimes you're on target, sometimes you're off. I mean, it's you're not nailing it all the time. Um, and that was prevalent in the class. Like I had a couple of things that I missed on uh, that were different exercises. Um, but even when I was asked to drop into the body of a, like they have a remote viewing of, that's a medical nature. Um, where you're supposed to guess the medical condition of a reference number again. They just give you a number. And they said, drop into this person's body and what's going on? And I was like, I had a feeling. I was just like, there's pain here. There's pain here. To me, that's kind of a right, right knee replacement, like where they cut the leg and put a knee in. And there's all kinds of pain here, and it's like glowing and whatnot. I was like, I don't know, right knee replacement. Nailed it. <laughs> How the hell did I do that? I don't know. I mean, you're reaching out into consciousness and touching on a reference number from an individual 
who's a real individual, they've agreed to be a target that somebody can, you know, guess what I have, guess my ailment. And it's not the only thing I came up with because I was like, she's had her appendix out. Um, she's on medication for high cholesterol, which is messing with her liver. She needs to get her liver checked. I came up with a whole laundry list of stuff because I didn't even know what they're talking about. But I was like, there's a right knee replacement. And they, were, and they looked and they were like, that's right. Is were you right about all of it? No, I don't know about all of it. They, but the target was their result that they were looking for was right knee replacement. So what did that visualization look like? It was more of a feeling. It was an intuition. Yeah, it was like I, I said, okay, target. And I just started feeling around my own body of what was going on. And I'm in good health. I don't have any health problems at all. So, but that's what I felt. I was like. You felt your knee. Yeah, I felt the he knee. I felt the, the pain here and here like above and below the knee. And I was like, well, that means they're probably replacing the knee. It's not just the hurt knee. They're probably going through an operation to replace the knee. But then I also felt stuff in my liver. I felt like my cholesterol was high when I don't have high cholesterol personally. Um, I felt like my, my appendix is gone, right side. And uh, my appendix is still in me. So I don't even have a scar or whatever, but and I was, I don't know if it was all correct, but I got the one thing that was correct that they were looking for. Why do you, earlier you had mentioned they put you in a room where it's um, shielded from from did you say radio signal or radio waves? Yeah. Why is that? Just to have control over the potential for signals to come in and out of the room to give you information. Like they want to remove all potential for any um, you know interference or. Uh, External frequency would that would that manipulate the the meditation? I don't know the the science behind whether or what frequencies might interfere with a viewing, but I know that they want to make sure that there's no signals coming in to where you'd have a gadget or something that could okay. communicate information to you about a target. Like they want to have strict scientific controls to make sure that the data they're getting, because they're still studying this stuff right now. They're still studying the science of remote viewing and the ability to look out through consciousness. And they want to just make sure that there are no outside interferences, that they maintain a complete separation between the remote viewer and the target, for instance, if they're practicing you know, target identification. And some of that stuff is amazing, where the remote viewer will say, okay, this person's standing in this certain office of this certain building, here's the complex, here are the other buildings around it, yada, 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 and they nail the whole thing. They wanna make sure that there's no way to get any information in through radio signals or uh, collusion of, of people trying to uh, scam the system or whatever. They wanna make sure that they have those controls all the time so they can rely on the data that they're getting. It's amazing yeah, stuff. It is. Let's take a quick break. And when we come back, let's get into some of the technology when they started implementing that.